I'm Glenn Campbell. I call myself a demographic philosopher. I'm looking at life and trying to predict the future through the lens of demography or the study of human populations. And today I want to talk about childhood trauma and how it relates to demography. And trauma refers to any kind of severe and lasting pain that a child may suffer over the course of his or her childhood and into young adulthood. So if a child witnesses a murder, that's a very traumatic thing that's probably going to haunt them for the rest of their lives. But there are many different kinds of trauma. There's a trauma of experiencing a severe and painful disease or experiencing some severe injustice. All of us have experienced traumas in our lives and, and some of them we deal with and some of them cripple us. So when you decide to have a child, you're also inflicting on them all the traumas of life. And this is a very good argument for not having children. It is the core of what I call the philosophical antinatalism movement, as exemplified by David Benatar. The basic argument is that life is a minefield of dangerous things, and you wouldn't have to submit a person to that minefield if you didn't have them to begin with. As long as childbirth is a choice, then by choosing to have a baby, you're also choosing to create a whole world of pain. And this is an authentic reason to not have children. For example, if in the 1930s you lived in Europe and you knew that there was a world war coming, it would be inhumane of you to bring a new child into the world just as the world war was beginning. You are knowingly submitting this child to pain. And the only response to this antinatalist argument is that there is something more important at stake. Yes, life is a traumatic thing, but it's also important to maintain your culture and maintain your community. And you can't do that without making babies. So you would go ahead and have babies anyway, in spite of the risks, because you felt that your community needed to be sustained. Now, there are some people who don't care what happens on planet Earth after they are gone. I'm not one of these people, and I hope you're not. But there are many among us who simply want a pleasurable life while they're here. They want a nice retirement. And when they die, they don't care what happens next. It's not their problem because they're not around anymore. These are people I cannot reason with because I have nothing in common with them. I'm one of the people who does care what happens to the world after I'm gone. I want to have some agency in this world. In other words, I want to have some influence in this world beyond my own life. And that agency involves people. So you could give all of your wealth to a noble cause, but there still has to be somebody, some human to implement that cause, to, to use the money that you have left who shares enough of your values to faithfully implement your plan. So where do those people come from? They have to come out of a womb somewhere. They have to be born. Because without people who share your basic core values and assumptions about the world, you have no agency in the future. I've used the example of environmentalists. And the, the popular environmentalist angle today is that I shouldn't have children because each child has a carbon footprint and by not having children, I'm reducing the stress on the environment. But what the environmentalists don't realize is that by not having children, they're turning the planet over to the non-environmentalists, the people who don't believe in protecting the environment, because they're going to continue having children. So if you truly love planet Earth, you've got to make a few environmentalists for the future. Otherwise, there will be no one to take up your cause after you're gone. So if you accept this premise that what happens after you're gone matters and you want to have some agency in this world where someone you have trained takes up the torch after you, then you have to make babies or participate in a project making babies. And of course, babies aren't the main thing. The main thing is the training program that goes on after you make the babies, the training program of well, 20 years or more where you are programming these little computers in your way of life and your way of thinking and your morality so that when you're gone, they will continue on autonomously without you. That's a big and complicated task. 
And it requires at first that you make some babies, even though the risks are high, even though it's highly possible that the child you create will be traumatized. If you look at this as a business relationship, you're going to mitigate this by producing a lot of babies by some system, perhaps cooperating with others. If you produce 10 children and train them in your way of life, there's a possibility that one or two of them may turn out badly, may suffer some serious disease or some serious deformity. But if the other eight or nine turn out fine and go on to profit your community, this may overcome the costs of raising those children who have difficulties. Now, that's looking at it from a business standpoint, from the external standpoint. There's no real way to calculate the costs of the trauma that one or two of your kids may suffer. Let's say you and your partners have 10 kids and one of them has childhood leukemia and suffers a long and painful death. Well, that long, painful death wouldn't have happened if you hadn't had the kid. But you may see this as a reasonable price to pay to raise the other nine kids successfully. Whenever you choose life, you're also choosing pain. Pain is an inevitable part of living. It's just like choosing whether or not to commit suicide. If you choose not to commit suicide, then you're also signing up for some painful episodes in your life up ahead. It's unavoidable. People who value pain highly and think it's too much to bear, they're going to kill themselves. People who value life and whatever you can produce during your life are going to plow through the pain and accept it. Now, in not committing suicide, you're accepting pain for yourself In having children, you are accepting pain for others. You are accepting that there's a possibility that the child you brought into the world is going to suffer great pain. And you do it anyway because you believe the odds are in your favor in producing whatever value that you think life generates. And this is a self-selecting mechanism. If you believe that life is worth creating and that the value of new life outweighs the costs in pain, then you're going to have children. If you believe that pain is more important and that imposing it on another human being is intolerable, then you won't have children and your point of view won't be carried over into the next life. In other words, life always selects life. It doesn't select the viewpoint that the pain is too great. It's like natural selection takes care of antinatalists. It disposes of them. So the only species that goes on living are the people who believe in natalism, who believe in creating life. One thing you can do once you choose life is try to minimize the trauma. Try to minimize the risk of something going bad when you bear and raise a child. And there are many ways to do this. You can choose an egg and sperm with minimal risk of congenital defects. So if you take a man and a woman who both have heart defects and they mate, well, there's a good chance that the children will have heart defects. So if you can avoid those gametes, then you diminish some of the risks of childhood trauma later on. There are also ways that you can raise children to minimize the chances of injury and minimize the chances of difficult conditions that cause emotional trauma. And of course, that's part of what parenting is all about. You try to protect your children so that they don't have to go through great emotional or physical distress. So if you do choose to produce life, you've got to accept that it's a roll of the dice. Things could turn out badly, but you're going to try to stack the deck so that they don't. You prepare yourself for the possibility that one of your experiments may go bad, and you do this by distributing risk over a large number of people. If two people have a baby and that baby turns out to have some serious defects, this is devastating to that couple. But if you have a lot of people raising children and one of those children has a problem, well, then you can distribute the responsibility and the cost of that problem over all the people who are raising those children. Then it's not quite so bad for each individual parent. So that all seems relatively benign given the proportions I'm suggesting. If you have 10 kids, one of them is going to have some serious problems, but the other nine will turn out okay and go on to support your community. But what if I told you that, in fact, 
everyone goes through childhood trauma, that all 10 of those kids are going to suffer some severe emotional distress, if nothing else. And that's because life by its nature is traumatic. There's no way to avoid it. And there's one kind of trauma in particular that everyone must suffer. It's a wall of fire that everyone must go through. And I call this real life adjustment trauma. Let me put this into perspective. How are humans different from other mammals? And one very obvious difference is our very long childhood. We marvel about how our own children grow so quickly, but in fact, in the animal world, they grow extraordinarily slowly. Look at other large animals like uh, cattle. Cattle reach full adult maturity in about two to three years. Then why does a human child require 14 or 15 years to reach full physical maturity? And the reason is that evolution seems to have deliberately slowed down human development to give us more time for programming. In other words, the real survival advantage that humans have over other animals is their ability to teach each other things. And this requires time. The more time you can give to childhood, the more time there is for programming all the complex skills that humans have acquired over time. So it seems to be an evolutionary benefit to slow the maturation process down so that children remain small and non-threatening to other adults, which gives them a protected period when other adults don't attack them and they can continue their learning. This is a period when you don't have to face the world directly because your parents are feeding you or your parents are showing you what to do. Your parents are essentially creating a little Disneyland for you, an artificial environment where you can learn new skills and thrive without having to face the harsh reality of the outside world. I think we can all agree that the outside world is a pretty rough place. and In the real world, there's a lot of things that can eat you and a lot of things that are going to be cruel to you. In human terms, there are a lot of humans out there that could hurt you and a lot of physical threats out there that could hurt you. And your parents protect you from all of that by creating this artificial environment for you, this home environment where you don't face the world directly. Instead, you face only a set of challenges that your parents have artificially set up for you. So your parents have you go to school, which is not reality. It's sort of a simulator for reality, where you go through these artificial set of exercises that are supposed to train you eventually for real life, but they are not real life. Childhood is a sort of holiday island that is created for you with the aim of giving you a chance to attain more skills before you're forced out into the real world. But unfortunately, at some point, you are forced out into the real world, and that is the central trauma that all of us must face. If we grew up in a bubble, then sooner or later, that bubble has to pop. And when it does, it's a very painful experience. It seems like a betrayal to us. It seems like our parents have lied to us because, in fact, they have. They've lied to us by telling us that there's justice in the world. And they've lied to us by making everything work just right. And they've lied to us by artificially protecting us from outside threats. And those sort of things make childhood wonderful, but they also condition us to some sort of inherent justice in the world and some sort of protection in the world. And when we step out into the real world beyond the bubble, we find this just isn't so. For example, we might step out of our home community and immediately become a victim of crime. And we're not prepared for it because crime didn't exist in our home community. This trauma can be conceptualized as a loss of innocence. So if something bad happens to a child, we say that they've lost their innocence or their innocence has been robbed from them. But in fact, this happens to every child. Sooner or later, you realize this world that I come from, this perfect environment that I came from, is not what the real world is. And what you often get is bitterness and cynicism because the world hasn't performed as you were taught it should. 
And that's one of the main challenges of parenthood, not just creating this perfect childhood environment, but also having an exit plan from it. And this is where most parents fail, especially the most well-to-do parents. They have no problem creating the perfect protective childhood environment. They just don't have an exit plan for how to release the child from it. And so maybe the child never leaves. Maybe he's 30 years old or 40 years old and still living at home with mom and dad. That's because the outside world is too traumatic. And part of the reason it's so traumatic is that the parents never let the pressures of reality into the child's most formative years. They were led to believe the world was a perfect place. And then when they stick their nose out into the world and it's not a perfect place, they run home to mom and dad. The big irony of real-life adjustment trauma is that it often hits the most privileged kids the worst. Imagine if you grow up, grew up in a perfect childhood where your parents catered to your every needs, where you had everything given to you and all sorts of wonderful privileges. It's going to be more difficult for you to adjust to independence than it would be for someone who has never had many of these privileges. I think back to my own childhood and the rich kids in my neighborhood and in my school, how they got everything. They got all the cool toys and they got to go on great vacations. And I remember how jealous I was of them at the time. But I also see in adulthood that many of them haven't adjusted very well. Once they get out into a world without all these protections and all these privileges, they're just kind of shell-shocked. They don't know what to do, and they keep coming back to mom and dad for help, and they find it difficult to move on. This is a really big problem for kids from small families with only one or two kids in the family because they get all sorts of attention, whereas kids from large families, they get used to the fact that they're not going to have a lot of privileges and that they have to negotiate for what they want, and so they might be a little bit better adjusting to this big traumatic event. Small families are naturally predisposed to generate overprotected and narcissistic children. And the reason is you have two parents who are entirely invested in this one option. So naturally, if they've invested everything they have in this, into this one person, they're going to be overprotective of this person. And they're going to be hyper vigilant about any threats to this person. And paradoxically, this overprotection makes it much more difficult for the child to adjust to real life when it's finally time to move on. They have been treated as superstars without having to do anything special. And when they go off into adult life, they expect this treatment to continue. So they strive for stardom. They want to be actors and they want to be worshipped Instagram influencers. If you come from a very cherished childhood, it's not satisfactory to simply be an average person or to be a cog in the machine. You want to run the machine and they want to move immediately into this leadership position. If you grew up instead as a member of a collective, which is what a big family is, then you don't have this natural expectation of being the star. You're willing to be a supporting player which in the long run might actually make you a better leader because you're willing to learn, you're willing to stop and learn and go and move through the ranks to get into a leadership position instead of going there immediately. And the only real way to make a child feel that he's part of a collective and not a superstar is to put him in a big family. He can still have a special place in that family, but he has to know that what he gets is a product of cooperation and working well with others. Having a big family also gives you a bigger support structure and probably more information about the outside world. If you're going through some kind of adjustment issue trying to deal with the outside world, there's a good chance there's an older sibling who's been through the same thing and can help you with it. Siblings have a special relationship. They compete with each other. They get in fights with each other, but they're also fiercely loyal. And when one of them is in trouble, they tend to pull together. Siblings give you different kinds of information than parents do. Siblings can be more frank with you. And because they're close to you in age, there's not as much of a power relationship. If you want frank advice without any sugarcoating, a sibling's probably the one to give it to you. 
So the whole trauma of childhood could be lessened by having a lot of siblings because they have all made the transition before you and they can advise you on what to do. So to get back to the bigger issues, if you expect to have agency in the world after you are gone, you or somebody has to have children. And the act of having children virtually guarantees some form of childhood trauma. We can't eliminate it, but we can find ways to reduce it by various structural decisions. One decision is to reduce the chance of birth defects by good prenatal care and by careful selection of gametes. And after birth, we can reduce trauma through the structure of the family itself. I believe a big family with a lot of closely spaced siblings is inherently less traumatic than a family with only one or two kids. And having a big family lets parents back off a bit. They can give children more freedom and more opportunity to make mistakes because they don't have all their eggs in one basket. You can send the kids to the store by themselves or in the care of an older sibling. Parents don't have to hover around at every moment to protect the child from everything. The only problem with a big family is the huge expense and the huge overall risk. It may be less expense on a per-child basis, but it still takes a lot of resources to raise 10 kids. It's probably more than what any couple can or should handle, but it's not too many for a group of parents to handle, which is the idea behind the modular family that I discuss elsewhere. Another structural issue within this family is that I believe children should be raised in an environment of moderate deprivation. Not necessarily poor, but not with many luxuries either. They should get good, nutritious food, but not a lot of exotic food and luxury food. They should have clothing, but maybe not the latest fashion. If the kids want luxuries, they've got to wheel and deal for them. They've got to earn the money for them or negotiate for them or join together with their siblings to get them. The more you give to children above and beyond the basic requirements, the more you are setting them up for failure later on, because eventually they're going to have to graduate into a world of moderate deprivation where they have to earn whatever luxuries they get. So when we are designing a family or a family system, we have to take this into account. It's not just a matter of protecting kids and giving them a warm environment. You also have to have an exit plan, a way to withdraw the supports without the kid falling apart. Well, the main lesson is you can't be overprotective. You can't make things too easy. And you can't be held in a state of suspended animation where your parents are protecting you from everything. You have to be able to roam. You have to be able to be a free-range kid who can venture outside the home, even though it's dangerous out there. To be able to deal with the inevitable traumas of your life, you have to have experienced traumas all along. And this means you need to be let out of the cage, let out into the world to the extent that it's practical so traumas can happen. And the trouble with families today is they tend to be small and and every child is the center of their parents' attention. The parents have invested everything in this child. So, of course, they are hypervigilant. They are overvigilant. And they never let the child go anywhere or do anything without careful monitoring. And this just expands the bubble. This makes the bubble bigger and bigger. So the child is protected for longer and longer. And when the bubble finally pops, it's far worse than if it had been deflated somewhat along the way. By allowing your kids freedom, you do run the risk that something bad is going to happen to one of your kids. But you accept that as the cost of allowing them to experience traumas and experience the real world on their own so that when they have to do it in the end, it's not so traumatic and difficult for them. 